All right. All right, you guys, how is everybody? Think they can hear me without sound? No? All right. Hey, this is really different, but it's pretty cool, huh? It's good to see everybody. Can you guys hear me back there? Right on. Good. Uh, this is great. Everybody. All right, it's good to see everybody. Hi, everybody. Oh, sorry. Some yeah. guys are still getting seated over there. Yeah. Yeah. Say hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. All right. We miss you. All right, good to see everybody. Uh, still people filing in, so hopefully, uh, I think we got like about half of our Wednesday night group, but that's good. People keep filing and find the place. Uh, great to be able, grateful to be able to use this backyard. Uh, Lisa and I thought we'd only ever rent places for the duration of our time on earth. And then, uh, some people stepped up and just Lord did amazing things. And, and, uh, we got a place where there was parking and we'd have a yard. We didn't know this was going to go down the whole COVID thing. Right. But it worked out really good. So we thought, you know, it'd be great for fellowship, you know? So the Lord is good. Amen. Uh, how are you guys doing? We got an awesome God. Amen. Gave us life, redeemed us from the pit. Uh, gave us his word, his spirit, his love, gave us his life, amen. Let's bow our hearts before him and get into the word. Father God, we come before you, and we thank you for your great goodness, Lord. It's because of you, Father, that we breathe each breath of air, Father. It's because of you that we, we can see, we can hear whatever senses you've given us to enjoy. Uh, we're so grateful, Father. There's so many things we should be thankful for. And so often, Father, we look at what we don't have. Father, may we focus on what we do have. And may we be thankful, Father, and grateful. And may we share our love with you and others. And may we help others as well, Father, with the abundance you've given each of us. And we pray that as we get into your word, that you speak to our hearts and that you would draw us close to you and that you would just do some deep things in our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see how long I can go before it gets dark, you know. This is pretty cool. We, my wife and I talked about for years... Uh, you know, who knows, there could be a time we're not even allowed to meet in our buildings. Of course, we didn't think it would happen quite like this, but it's just kind of interesting. If you can take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You know, I don't know if I'll improvise much, but these birds tweeting going by, you can see when Jesus was out giving the Sermon on the Mount when he was talking about the lilies and the, and the birds of the air and how he was probably improvising a lot as he, uh, you know, felt impressed to make points to people, but it's interesting. Uh, in Philippians chapter 4, this is one of the prison epistles that Paul wrote from prison. And when he writes this epistle, he's, you know, many picture him as being chained between a couple guards in a Roman prison. He wrote Colossians, he wrote Ephesians, the church at Ephesus and the church at Colossae. And here to, to the Philippians, he wrote uh, the book of Philippians to those in Philippi. And it's kind of fascinating when you look at his epistles because you can't really tell that Paul is in prison except for what he says because he's not whining, he's not moaning, he's not crying. In fact, you read the word joy more in Philippians and rejoice than all of his other epistles by far because his circumstances did not dictate his, who, he, who he was, did dictate his attitude. He wasn't depressed because he was chained between a couple of uh, guards and they weren't like the prisons today here in the United States, which many of them are you know, nicer than a lot of homes for people, you know. Uh, they were quite dirty, quite filthy, uh, but yet Paul was able to rejoice because he saw the bigger picture. He knew he belonged to God. He knew he was heaven-bound. He knew that he was caught up in the purpose of God's will and in the wonder of his love. So when I look, we look at Philippians chapter 4, I went to this verse, this passage, and it was going to be one of many passages I was going to share. And I, I kind of got arrested my consciousness regarding this passage because I thought it's so instructive regarding some of the weird things going on today, just a lot of strange things. And a lot of people are out of sorts from COVID for several months now. People, many people have been locked down. Many people have been out of work. Churches all over the nation have been shut down. There's all kinds of, you know, in the midst of people being fearful of catching a very serious disease, uh, they're also concerned about other problems with people being locked down because who knows how many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people 
have died because of crime, because of suicide, because of through depression, uh, because of diseases that were they weren't able to get operated on. It's just horrifying when you think of both sides of the issue. There's a lot of sadness. And one of the saddest things that I've seen happening in the body of Christ, because there is some confusion among the churches, is people dividing over issues that you ought not divide over, you know? And people, we know, man, when there's essential doctrine and that's denied, of course you, you divide over that, you know? Someone denies that Jesus is God. They deny that he is he paid for our sins. They deny that the scripture is the word of God. They deny the doctrine of eternal judgment. They deny the virgin birth. They deny the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Christ. These things, of course, uh, you have to divide over. Then there's other things that are important issues biblically, where you're, they're scriptural, where you might have you know, denominational differences, but you still love one another as brethren. Amen. But we want to make sure that, that in essentials we have unity. Amen. And in non-essentials, we still have, you know, charity toward one another. Amen? And love one another and encourage one another. So if you go to Philippians chapter 2, it's very interesting because Paul is dealing with a, dis a dispute between a couple sisters in the Lord. And let's read, go ahead and read verse 2. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Let's read that again. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Okay? Uh, the King James says, says to be of the same mind in the Lord. I think the ESV, the English Standard Version, says to be in agreement in the Lord. And these two sisters were at, at each other's throats, in a sense. And we don't know exactly why they were fighting, why they were having a squabble in the church, or why they had some kind of quarrel going on. And I think it's on purpose that the Lord doesn't let us know that. Because if it was a very specific thing, then we might just think of what they were going through and not really apply it to our own lives when we go through things. But I think he leaves it open because the church he was addressing there at Philippi, they knew what it was, so he didn't have to list it. And Paul's very direct, by the way, here, isn't he? Just to bring it up. And it's interesting when you think about this, he's very direct, but he doesn't specifically state what it is. And what blows me away is some people will divide over, there'll be church committees about the color of a carpet in a church, right? And there'll be church division over the color of a carpet. No kidding. I mean, you know, strange things, you know? And right now I've read, I've heard that there are many dividing over masks right now, you know? In our church, we have unity on that. It doesn't mean everybody agrees with each other, but we don't have a church split down the middle over masks because we recognize that we should be enveloped in Christ's love and his will, and that should take preeminence in our lives. Amen? Our love for one another and the relationships that we built with one another in Christ way transcend a view that we might have of wearing a mask or, you know, when exactly, you know, or how and what have you, or how thick it should be or what have you. Amen? Uh, and I was telling my wife, you know, I said, down the line, you think, I know what I think a lot of people will divide over is vaccinations. I think you'll see a lot of Christians dividing over. A lot of people in the world will, for sure. But in the church, I think, because you have a lot of people that are anti-vaxxers and a lot of people that are pro-vaxxers, you know. Uh, you have people that are homeschoolers and people that are in a private school. And you have people that are in a public school. And we've had people with all three views in our fellowship on homeschooling, private schooling, public schooling. But you know what? It has never been a source of division in our church, even though people might have strong opinions about that, because the love of Christ comes first, Amen. The gospel, the love for one another, respecting each other's, uh, uh, you know, ability or uh, right to have their own positions on things, as much as you may agree. Agree, amen. So we have to be careful. We don't know what exactly they were disagreeing on. I don't think they were disagreeing on masks because that was probably an issue back then, right? They weren't disagreeing on vaccinations. We can pre be, be sure of that, or the color of the church carpet because they were meeting in homes and Paul's in a prison and he'd say, "Hey, really, guys, <laughs> I'm in prison and you guys are arguing about uh, the color of your carpet," you know. So we need, to go, we need to transcend and really be about what matters, amen? Doesn't mean we can't voice our opinions, we can't love one another and disagree with each other and even be passionate about our views, you know? I've got my own views and we've got our own views on a lot of these subjects. But I also recognize, like, on a lot of the subjects we just mentioned, uh, whether it's schooling or whether it's vaccinations or, you know, whether masks, how helpful they are. I personally uh, can have a viewpoint on something 
but not, but recognize there's also good, good cases in that I'm not the end all in my opinion, you know? There's a lot of fluent studies out still to this day and there's a lot of propaganda. I think on both sides actually, I think a lot of people nitpick and cherry pick certain things. And we all have to be generous toward one another and recognize that if we're fully right, fully wrong, part right, part wrong, what matters is that we're following the Lord, amen? And that we're loving one another in Christ. That's huge. Now, I think it's interesting because remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? Where Paul said he besought the Lord three different times and requested that he would take away the thorn in the flesh? Do you know what, the thorn, you know what it says the thorn in the flesh was? No, because it doesn't. And again, and there's a lot of speculation. I have certain views. I know in Galatians, he talked about what large letters he wrote. And he doesn't mean in the Greek, it's not large, a large letter, but letters he wrote. Because earlier in the epistle, he talks about how they would have, they, they bore with him in his body ailment. And they would have given him his, their own eyes and treated him like an angel so he could see. So he put those things together in Galatians. It seems like Paul was either fully blind or partially blind. Perhaps that was a stone in the flesh. I lean toward that being a very strong possibility, but I'm not dogmatic about it because it's not clear when you read 2 Corinthians. And I like the fact that the Lord leaves it open because if we knew exactly what it was with Paul, we might not apply it to our own lives when we're going through something and we wonder why the Lord doesn't take it. When we go through some kind of physical ailment, we go through something that uh, is impossible to deal with outside of him, which makes us cry out to him. Because I believe the Lord leaves some things open so we can learn to apply things more easily to our lives. And I believe that's what's happening here. And I want to give you different ways in which the Lord encourages these two sisters who are in disagreement with each other to get along, to have peace. And by the way, this should, this should apply to all of us at different times in our lives, amen? You might apply it to you and your spouse if you're, if you're married. It might apply it to you and a coworker right now, or to you and a friend, or you and a, a parent, or a child, or somebody in your family. Uh, somebody, you and a neighbor or what have you, and uh, somebody, you and somebody in the fellowship. And I think it's really instructive because right now we really need to emphasize that it's important that we love each other because Jesus said in the last days before he returns, there would be a lot of spiritual deception, but he said what? Lawlessness would what? Increase, amen? Do we see lawlessness increasing around our country? Big time. Do you know murders are way up even though most people are still honker down in their homes, you think murders would be way down. Isn't that crazy? He said that ethnic group would be against ethnic group. How sad is that? When you have people that are being lawless and not loving one another, and he said the love of many would grow cold. We're seeing that. People don't really know what love even is now. We're seeing a lot of that happening. But he said that we're supposed to watch our hearts. We're supposed to keep our hearts soft during these times. Amen? So it's imperative that we understand that we should long for and seek for those things that make peace between our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? So, as we're looking at chapter 4, verse 2, I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. It's kind of interesting when you look at the meaning of their names. Iodia means, it's from a plant, actually, that was renamed later, but it means could mean fragrance, you know, beautiful fragrance. And, and it's just interesting because when you start looking at the things that Paul encourages, go ahead and look at verse 1. Therefore, my beloved, what? Brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Notice he speaks of them as brethren. He speaks of them as brethren, as family. Brethren refers to brothers and sisters in Christ, amen. He's reminded them before he urges Yodia and Syntyche, to find agreement in the Lord, to recognize that we're family, amen? And that's one thing that's imperative if you're going to transcend lawlessness, which will even work its way into the church, and a, sp a party spirit that'll work its way into the church and divide people, you need to recognize that we're family, amen? You know, I have right in my, in my very immediate family with my two daughters and my son. I have one daughter who just became a nurse and she believes strongly in vaccinations. I have another daughter, who, Holly, who has the opposite view about vaccinations. Both of them have the same motive, safety of, you know, health safety, you know. Just they see it from different vantage points. And guess what they do, and they continually do, love one another. They might strongly disagree, but they love each other dearly. 
and they haven't, by the grace of God, let that divide them because they recognize that they're family. Amen? We are family in Christ. Amen? So we don't allow our differences of opinion in those issues to cause us not to fellowship with each other. Amen? You know, to, you know, break fellowship and say, you're not really my brother or sister anymore. You know, over such issues. So that's one thing I think it's interesting that Paul drops in there. And it's interesting. Notice in verse 1, a word that he uses twice. Therefore, my what? Before he says brethren, he calls them what? Beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my what? Beloved. He calls them beloved twice. The love of God, it says, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen? When we're born again, the, God, the Lord comes to live in us. We bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, long-suffering, all those wonderful things because we're born of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. God lives in us. He changes who we were before we were Christians. Some of you knew me <laughs> before I was a Christian. One thing was really interesting after I became a Christian and became part of the family of God. I recognized who I was in Christ as part of the beloved. People that knew me before Christ didn't recognize me often. People come to church, I can't believe Joe Schimmel became a Christian. He's pastoring this church, you know. And then people that came to know me after I became a Christian couldn't comprehend how I could be a certain way before I became a Christian because they've only known me one way. Which is all, you know, the Bible says if anyone being Christ is a new creation, amen? Behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new, amen? God does a miracle. Does God still do miracles today? All the time. Every time someone's born again, man, and has new life in Christ, that's a miracle from God, amen? So we're beloved, but because of what God has done in sending His Son and loving us, that teaches us how to relate to one another. Listen to 1 John 4, 19 and 20. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So the first two things that I think would really be a huge encouragement to Yodia and to Sintiki is, hey, we're family, number one, amen? Number two, we're beloved. Whatever you guys are going through, should be, you should be looking at things from that perspective, Amen. And sometimes when believers have disagreements with one another, they forget that they're family. Amen? And they forget, not only that they're family, but they forget that we're, we're new creations and we have a new spiritual DNA and we're called to love one another. And even love our enemies. Amen? Jesus said, what better are you than the pagans? Because the pagans, they love their own family members. He goes, how are you better than them if you only love your family members? He says, if you want to be like your father in heaven, love your enemies. Amen? Remember when he told, Jesus told them about the, about the Good Samaritan, right? Remember, the Samaritans were a hated people group. When we, we're not going to get all of that because I just did a whole message on that a few months back. But, I mean, they were like Samaritans. The way that the Jews had looked about the Samaritans was, was pretty sad. But he let them know, that, hey, those are your neighbors. And we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, number three, he exhorts them. He not only encourages them that we're brothers and sisters, we're family, that we're, to be, that we're beloved, we're to love one another. But number three, that we're to stand firm in the Lord. Look at verse one again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Number three, we need to stand firm in the Lord. That means we need to obey the marching orders that we've been given. That means we need to dig our feet into the rock of Christ he talked about the two different men, right? One was wise and one was a fool. He said the wise man built his house on the rock, amen? The foolish man built his house in the sand. When the storms came, right? When the floods came, great was the fall of the man who built his life in the sand. But Jesus said the one who built his life on the rock, on his word, is likened unto a wise man. Thank you, Nico, for taking care of that over there. They mean well. Remember they're brothers and to love them, bro. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> for our live stream audience we got a bunch of or some kids on the on the trampoline right now and they're just having a good time so that's what that was about no skirmishes to pray about or to worry about anyway so number three stand fast in the lord do you know there's so many scriptures that talk about standing firm in the lord standing fast in the lord first thessalonians 3 8 for now we live if you are standing fast in the lord galatians 5 1 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has set you free, and don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Means, uh, standing in unity. Philippians 1.27, back up to chapter 1 if you're in Philippians, and look at verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or you remain absent, I will hear of you, and you are standing what? And that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now notice that he emphasized standing in unity in the spirit of one mind, and standing with the focus of the gospel. He's going to get into that with, with Syntyche and, and Yodia, because that they're losing focus on what they're supposed to be all about. And they're getting on other issues, apparently. So we're all supposed to stand together in love. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. So we're called to stand firm in the faith. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel, Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. We're supposed to stand firm by putting on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 and 13 and 14 says... Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against all the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And then he goes into the different parts of the armor of God. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, which you have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Romans 11, 19 through 22, we're called to stand in the faith. He says, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen. But kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too will be cut off. So, another way we're supposed to stand, this is very important, we're supposed to stand on our knees. What do I mean when I say we need to stand on our knees? Anybody think of what I mean here? I've said this a couple times in the past. What does it mean to stand on your knees? Seems impossible, amen? Do we have a contortionist here that could demonstrate that? No, it's physically impossible. But what I mean by saying standing on our knees, I mean we need to be knelt before the Lord. We need to be bowed down before the Lord. We need to have humility before the Lord, amen? And remember who we are. By the way, this is really beautiful seeing you guys all here. It's kind of like we're in the wilderness. It's really cool. There's flowers behind you guys. You're already beautiful, but you're like really beautiful right now. It's interesting. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 5, 12. I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is a true grace of God Stand firm in it. Stand firm in it. You catch that? Now the context here is Peter, throughout 1 Peter, the first 11 verses, he's exhorted them toward humility. That's where we, we read, God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. We read that also in James 4. We also read that in Proverbs, a quotation from the book of Proverbs. I think it's fascinating that the two times in the New Testament that you see, it's kind of interesting, think about it. I think it's instructive. The two times that you see that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud, the two times you see that, it's in the context of spiritual warfare as well. And in, in, in James chapter 4, he talks about resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In 1 Peter, he says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Before that, though, he talks about young men clothing themselves with humility. And believers in general, God gives grace to the humble. And he'll exalt them in due time. Right? But he resists the proud. And after he's been talking about the grace of God and who receives the grace of God, God gives grace to who? The humble. It's conditional. God's grace is offered to everyone. Paul says in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Amen? Because God so loved the world. Amen? But guess what? There's a condition by which you receive it. You must become like a little child to be converted, Jesus said. You must humble yourself and recognize that he is God. We are not. Amen? That he knows everything. We know very little compared to what there's no in the universe. Amen? And he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. 
And it's of that grace in that context that the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5.12, I've written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Stand firm in it in the Greek is a present tense imperative. It's a command. Okay? It's, it means to continue to stand firm in it. How do you continue to stand in the grace of God? On your what? On your knees. Amen? Anybody been on those cliffs or in those rocks by the ocean where it's just, you got to be really careful because you feel like you get blown off? You ever been in a place like that where it's just really windy? There were just some people that were, it was a couple, I think, maybe a family of a few or so that were just washed off a rock. They just disappeared. I don't know if they recovered their bodies. But when the wind's really howling and really blowing and you're in a cliffy area, if you like to hike and like I do, doesn't usually get like that but i've been in some gnarly areas the best place you could be is on your knees at that point you know and that's how you stand well that's how you stand in the lord too you stay humble before him you stand in his grace so number three we stand fast in the lord number four the fourth encouragement is that they're called to live in harmony with one another in the lord look what he says specifically to syntyche and Euodia in verse two or chapter four of Philippians, verse 2. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in where? In the Lord. That's huge, you guys. Because we don't know what their debate was. We don't know what they were disagreeing over. If it was a theological debate they were having, guess what? They could find harmony in the Lord because the Lord is not the God of confusion, amen? They'd have to sit down and say, okay, what does the scripture say in this area? I don't know that it was a theological issue, though. And if it wasn't a theological issue and they were divided over something not very important, guess what? Their walks with the Lord and their commonality in Christ should have transcended whatever they were going through to where they could still find love and unity with each other because of the common ground that they had in Jesus. Amen? Are you with me? Do you understand that? Apparently they forgot their common ground in the Lord. And their greatest pur greater purpose for knowing him, loving him, walking with him. It's pretty heavy when you really think about it. And it's interesting because when you forget the common ground you have in Christ and you start focusing on little issues that are nowhere close to being unified in Christ, you can all of a sudden get away from your first love. You can all of a sudden look at people as your enemy or harbor bitterness, malice, anger, hatred, those kinds of things. And you want to make sure those things don't take over your heart. And that you walk in love and humility toward God and others. Amen? And that brings me back to Romans 14. In Romans 14, there were believers that disagreed on the day of worship. Remember Paul says, one man steams one day above another? Because a lot of people looked at Sunday, the Lord's Day, as the main day. Some, the Sabbath. And Paul said, others look at every day as being alike. He says, let each of you be persuaded in your own mind. Amen? Because some of them were judging each other harshly. Paul says that no one judge you according to a Sabbath day. Those were mere shadows, but the reality is in Christ. Amen? And Paul was talking about those who believed you shouldn't eat any meat. Paul said he knew he could eat meat in faith, but he wouldn't eat it if it would cause somebody to stumble, you see. Uh, so, you know, you can eat meat, but if you're somebody that's thinking, man, you know, I can't believe you're eating an animal, you're fellowshipping with them, you know, you might be, have to just suck it up and have a salad or something, you know? I know that could be tough. We're used to having what we want to eat here and everything else, but there's times to just show grace and love until that person can come of a better understanding what it means to be free in Christ, amen? And hopefully you can help him to that end. Paul certainly do, does that. He mentions that even in Romans 14. He says he knows he can, doesn't have to eat meat, I, that he can eat meat, but he doesn't make it a big issue uh, as far as unity goes. And there's a saying that I quote once in a while, and it's wrongly attributed to Augustine almost by everybody, there's no evidence at all that Augustine ever said this. It was a first said that we know by a Lutheran German pastor, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Amen? That's a very, very biblical saying. And we're strong on essentials, man, being unified. Amen? We're strong on having uh, some liberty with non-essentials, but we still stand on truth in a loving way. And we try to have charity toward everyone. Amen? So it's important that as the Lord's sheep, right, his, his lambs that we love one another, lambs shouldn't be biting each other, amen? That's not really natural. 
uh, we should be concerned about the wolves, amen? Not about each other. We should be loving each other, amen? And, and encouraging one another. And we're called in Scripture to maintain the unity of the faith because Satan is the great divider. He wants to divide us from our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul writes, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, it's interesting. I love that because notice he says that we're to maintain the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. When it's not saying achieve unity, we don't try to achieve. We have unity already through Christ when we come to him, amen? Christ says, praise in his high priestly prayer, sanctify them by thy truth, amen? We're unified in him, but we need to maintain that unity through continuing to seek Christ and continuing to be in the Lord. And I think it's interesting when I love, I love to study nature and the lessons that we can learn uh, from nature. And I think it's quite amazing that... When he's talking about being, you know, the same mind here and in agreement, in harmony in the Lord, there's something beautiful about harmony, amen? And I, I love it. How many of you love it when you see geese flying way up high in the sky in that big V formation? There's something so beautiful about that that just, I think, resonates to our hearts. And, and scientists are still trying to get an idea of how they understand a lot of birds that, you know, navigate, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. They, they, it, because... It's God built that in them, amen? And they're trying to understand how that works, and to this day, they don't really understand it fully. But geese are, are, are different in some ways because they fly in that beautiful V. You hear them honking, right? You know? A lot of people think, you know, you know that, well, this is, this is what's crazy about geese. When they're flying together, they get 71% more distance if they're flying in the V than if they're flying as Lone Rangers. Can you imagine if you could get 71% more efficiency in your job? Or the same amount of work at home when you're cleaning up or whatever you're doing, 71% more in the same amount of time using the same amount of energy? That'd be pretty awesome, amen? How about 71% greater growth in your, in your spiritual life? That happens when you have Christian unity. I'm not saying specifically 71%, but we know that the science shows that when they fly behind each other, like a form of drafting, they get uplift. Do you understand that? They get uplift that's automatic from each other just by virtue of flying together. And I've, I, I love that illustration. I've used that before because I just think it's so awesome. Uh, they enjoy that, you know, 71% greater output for the same efforts just because they're together. God, God created us as believers to be together. We're called the body of Christ. The Bible says, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Amen. We're interdependent one with another. We have different roles, different things the Lord has called us to do. And it's a beautiful thing. King Solomon, the wisest man of his time, declared, two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. You're far stronger when you're unified. The Bible says three chords are stronger, two chords are stronger than one, right? And the three chord strand is not easily broken. There's a pretty funny uh, Peanuts cartoon I read some time ago where Lucy demands, remember Lucy, she demands Linus to change, she demands that Linus change the TV channel. And, you know, and Lucy, you know, by curling her fingers into a fist, she, you know, Linus says, you know, what makes you think you can walk right up and take over? Asked Linus. And Lucy says, these five fingers. She says, individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. <laughs> Which channel do you want? Asked Linus. Turning away, he humbly looks down toward his own fingers and says, why can't you guys get organized like that? You know. And uh, it's kind of interesting because when you think of it, yeah, five fingers aren't much. You can't really... You know, unless you're good at poking people in the eye when you're defending yourself, not do much, but you form them into a fist, it becomes something powerful. But we form ourselves into what God's called us to, amen? I mean, hundreds of millions of people know the Lord Jesus Christ through the years, through the centuries, 
as a result of Christians walking together, the church spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Small band of disciples, man, turned the Roman Empire upside down. Amen. And now the gospel is all over the world. Number four, number five. Paul doesn't resolve himself to just hope that these two women will get together, but he encourages them and he reaches out and he reaches out to what he calls his true companion in the Lord. Verse three of chapter four. Indeed, true companion. Now we don't know because who specifically he's speaking of here. I ask you also uh, to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement. We don't know if Clement is Clement of Rome who wrote a couple of epistles in the late, latter part of the first century or not. Some believe so. Uh, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he's encouraging his true companion to play a role in helping Syntyche and Yodia get along. He's asking this person to be a peacemaker. And you know, it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of guesses as to who this might be. Some say it's probably Timothy. Probably not because this letter is addressed in part from Timothy. So I don't think that's probably Timothy. Uh, a good guess is Epaphras or Epaphroditus because in chapter 2, go back to chapter 2, verse 15, Epaphroditus had brought the letter to Paul, or brought, I'm sorry, their questions to Paul, and Paul's sending him back. And look what he says about Epaphroditus. Chapter 2, verse 15, or verse 25, I'm sorry. Go to verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Now, why is this guy sick? We, kind of, we find out. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. In other words, he's going to help them as well. Verse 29, receive him uh, then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death. Look at why. Why did he come close to death? For the work of what? Christ. When somebody's sick, close to death, don't condemn them and say, oh, they must have done something really horrible. And you, there's a false gospel out there right now, right, called the prosperity gospel. It's the most popular version of the gospel on so-called Christian television. The health and wealth gospel. God always wants you healthy. He always wants you wealthy. You just got to say the right words. And it almost becomes like magic or witchcraft or something. And it's not scriptural. The Apostle Paul told Timothy to take a puny or a little bit of wine for his frequent stomach ailments. Because Paul was probably drinking the water, which probably had a lot of bacteria in it like it does in certain countries today. And he wanted to kill the bacteria. Now it's interesting that Paul told, Paul could have healed Timothy if God wanted him to, but he didn't. He had the gift of healings and miracles we read in Scripture. But God doesn't always heal. But Epaphroditus was sick and almost dead because of the work of Christ. You could be totally in the will of God and have ailments. Amen? It happens all the time. In fact, guess what? Every single one of us is dying right now. We know that, right? The moment you're born, you already start to die, even though you're growing. The Bible says the outer man is what? decaying day by day but the inner man is what being renewed day by day for the christian for the believer those who are trusting the lord amen our spirit is being renewed so when it comes to being in christ we need to recognize that our bodies our spirits have been redeemed amen you are saved right now if you're trusting christ these things are written first on that you may know 512 that you have eternal life amen we have life in christ right now amen we've been redeemed we die today absent from the body is present with the lord but guess what our bodies have not yet been redeemed, amen? All of creation groans to be delivered, and we look forward to that day, amen? So it's interesting, it says, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, verse 30, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. I love this guy. He's a soldier, a fellow so soldier. He's going all the way to Rome, you know, on the path of the church at Philippi. He's going to go back 
to Philippi for Paul. And he's already almost died just serving Christ. But guess what? It may be this guy. He may be the perfect guy to go and talk to these two women because he is so selfless and so full of Christ and so wanting people to know Christ and walk with Christ. But you know what? Every time I see a name suggested in this, I've never seen a woman's name suggested by any commentator. And I scratch my head. Especially since Titus, it says in Titus, have the older women teach the what? Younger women, amen? And also because Syntyche and Euodia are listed in the verse that we just read as fellow workers with Paul. They were arm in arm with him in sharing the gospel. And you know what it says in Romans chapter 14? Listen to this, chapter 15, verse 14. Listen to this, this will encourage every one of you. I am, I am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you are all filled with goodness. He's talking about those who are following the Lord. You're all filled with goodness and competent and competent to admonish and counsel and instruct one another. Do you know that? Somebody's going through a spiritual struggle. They need encouragement. Oh, you know what? We got to get you to a counselor. Did you know if you're a Christian, God wants to use you, amen? He wants to encourage us to use one and to bless one another, encourage one another, amen? And that's why we want to make sure we're growing in Christ and we're growing spiritually so we can be of optimum value to the Lord and building one another up in Christ, amen? So our brothers and sisters, God wants to use each of us to encourage one another, to grow one another. And so I think it's just quite beautiful, quite amazing. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. When you see a Syntyche and Iodia having a strong dispute and dividing over something that's not essential, you need to pray for them, amen? You need to love them. You need to encourage them. You say, Lord, maybe I'm supposed to encourage them to forgive one another, to love one another, to go forward with one another. Amen? We should all be peacemakers. As I said, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the what? They shall be called the sons of God. Amen? You want to be called the sons of, a son of God? Be a peacemaker. Jesus is the, is the ultimate. He's the unique, only begotten son of God. And he left heaven, amen, to come to us, to bring us through his cross to the Father and bring reconciliation. Amen? and bring reconciliation between us and others as well. On the other hand, guess what? You don't want to be the opposite of a peacemaker. You don't want to be sowing seeds of division in people's hearts, trying to cause them to be divided from other believers. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 19 says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are in an abomination to him. Really, what are they? Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. 60 million plus babies in our nation right now. Innocent blood that shed. 10 times the Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. A heart that devises wicked plans. We see that all over today. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. You don't have to watch a lot of the news today to see that. Uh, even with a lot of the journalists, unfortunately. And one who sows, listen to this, and one who sows discord among brothers. One who divides the brothers. You want to make sure you're a peacemaker, not someone who divides your brothers and sisters in Christ. Not one that sows seeds of division between brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that's one of the seven things God hates. And now notice what it says there. It doesn't say he hates the act of bringing division between brothers. He actually hates a brother or, or I'm not, not a brother, but one who would sow division among the brethren. That's serious, serious stuff. That's why Paul writes in Romans 16, verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to which out of those uh, cause divisions, and I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's heavy stuff, man. And when you're trying to bring unity and encourage brothers to be unified in Christ, you have to be careful. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, if you see a brother caught in a trespass or a sin, restore him in a spirit of gentleness, watching your own self so you too are not tempted. So you've got to be really careful. You've got to be very prayerful. Now, I have to be careful not to overstate this because if I overstate this, the very thing I'm trying to encourage you in the Lord and achieve is that we encourage one another to love one another and encourage one another to build each other up and that we're peacemakers can cause you to become gun-shy because there can be a danger in it. 
What danger do I mean? If you're proud and arrogant and you see somebody that's fallen short of God's glory, someone that's going through a spiritual struggle, and you have the wrong attitude, you become prey to the enemy. So you have to make sure, it says, let him, him was spiritual. And right before that, in chapter 5, he said the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, love, suffering, gentleness, goodness, all these things. He mentions gentleness. So he says in chapter 6, to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ by loving one another. Then he says also in that passage that them who are spiritual, that means you have the fruit of the Spirit, you're walking in the Spirit, restore those who have fallen in a spirit of gentleness, which is mentioned as the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5. So we need to be gentle with people. Remember Jesus said, before you remove the speck out of your brother's eye, get rid of the beam in your eye. Amen? Last thing I want to do is go get eye surgery and see that my eye surgeon has a big beam in his eyes when he's doing the surgery. It's going to really thrash me. It's going to really mess me up. Okay? And that's what we're like if we're not walking with the Lord and we try to help someone spiritually. Because guess what? We can become very judgmental. We're called to be discerning but not have a spirit of judgmentalism. We're called to be discerning between good and evil and love one another and restore each other but not have an attitude that's pharisaical. And you need to make sure you walk in humility. And you have to be careful too when you're reaching out to others that you don't get infected by the same venom that's infected them. Jude one twenty three says, Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. You have to be careful and hate the garment that's polluted by the flesh when you're snatching other people out of the fire so you don't get infected. I've seen people as in my ministry last 30 years as a pastor and in ministry before that, doing evangelism and so forth, I've seen people go help someone on a rescue mission and then get caught up in the same thing they're trying to help the person in because they weren't careful. The Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Amen? So I want to be very watchful, very aware, very prayerful, very humble. Say, Lord, just use me to your glory. Help me to be a blessing. And when Paul says restore such a one, the word restore in the Greek is used for mending nets, fishing nets. It's also used for setting bones, amen? And, and when you're setting someone's bone, you've got to be careful, firm, but wise and accurate, so to speak. And so it is as believers. We have to be very, very careful how we tread. And I think it's interesting because when I was reading about geese before, not only the formation they fly in and how they get 71% more efficiency when they fly together because of the uplift and so forth, but I think it's really cool. I've read stories about uh, when a geese gets wounded or shot or is sick and falls out of formation. Uh, it's been witnessed that uh, sometimes a couple of other geese will fall out of formation to hang out and, and help them until they're ready to join, you know, or ready to move on together with those other geese. And as believers, we have to be careful as Christians that we don't shoot our wounded, amen? Too many Christians shoot their wounded. We don't do that, amen? We try to restore one another, encourage one another, and love one another, amen? So it's very, very important that we get this, that we, we understand this. Now, number six, he reminds them of their calling. Look at verse three. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, who the rest of my, my, rest of my fellow brothers. Now it's interesting. Listen to what he says about these women. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Syntyche and Yodia were involved in Paul's ministry, sharing his struggle to get the truth of God's word out sharing the gospel that Jesus Christ died for people's sins, that he was buried, that he rose again and conquered the grave. That's what they were all about, too. And he's, what's he trying to do? He's reminding them, and I love this, he's reminding them of their calling. He's reminding them that, hey, the focus should be the gospel, getting the gospel out. What are you two sisters getting hung up on? You're losing focus in the midst of arguing or debating whatever they were debating or arguing. Souls were perishing. And we have to be careful to make sure we remember our calling. Remember the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation? Remember that church? I mean, they were a pretty powerful church. Five out of the seven churches that Jesus addresses in the book of Revelation, verses chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, he, has, he tells them to repent. Some people think repentance is just for the lost, but <laughs> repentance is for the church too when it needs to be preached, amen, in the church. 
That's why you hear me talk a lot about repentance and make sure, making sure metanoia is the Greek word, having a change of heart, change of mind, that leads to a change of behavior. In fact, a lot of biblical counseling, when I get together with people, is all about metanoia. It's about having a change of heart and a change of mind to become Christ-like, to put Christ first in one's life. And oftentimes when people are going through struggles, it's because they've got their eyes off of Jesus. But this church at Ephesus, they were pretty radical in, in that they knew their doctrine. They dotted their theological I's and crossed their doctrinal T's. He says, I know you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. He says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which are a false cultic Gnostic group, according to the church fathers. He says, which I also hate. He commends them for being right theologically, but guess where they got off? They got away from their first love. And then he says to do three things to the church at... He says, I have this against you because you have left your first love. Jesus. He says, number, number one, he says, remember from whence thou art fallen. Meaning, remember where your walk was. That's what Paul does here. He reminds them, he wants them to be reminded of, of their struggle in the gospel, in serving Jesus with him, getting the gospel out, lifting up the name of Jesus, lifting up the name of Christ. And he says, Paul, but Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, remember from whence thou art fallen, number one. Number two, Repent. Do a 180 spiritually. Number three, do those things you did at first. Not only have a change of heart, change of mind, but walk your talk. Get back to serving the way you did initially when you were first serving Christ. And you might look at your own walk. If, you, if you're in the doldrums, if you're struggling, you know, you're like, man, I just, in fact, I, I heard about a sister yesterday. My daughter Holly was talking to me here at the house yesterday, and we had a great chat for a while, quite a while, and she was talking about a sister in the fellowship. And she said, the sister said that between going to work, you know, coming home, eating, and doing whatever she had to do, it was becoming so routine. And then she said, you know what I did? She goes, wow, you know, what's going on with my walk? And she said, then I started reaching out to a few sisters, getting together with a few sisters, having Bible studies with them, encouraging the Lord. And wow, there's so much joy in my walk right now, you know. And, I, and what blows me away right now in our fellowship that I think is so beautiful and I'm seeing it in a myriad of ways beyond what I've ever seen in our fellowship. I've seen so many different, you know, all of us get together like this, uh, you know, Bible study midweek, and Sunday, of course, the larger fellowship, all get together, it's beautiful. But it's really neat seeing so many young groups getting together, whether it's going out sharing the gospel, witnessing in different places, going on mission trips, the Mexico trip that we just had, older groups, different age groups, you know, college age groups, career age, and so forth. Uh, there's so much excitement, and there's so many, uh, so much young, excited, you know, young excited folks in, in our fellowship that have just that have been homegrown here in our fellowship. Others that have just come from out of other from other places. Others that have been one to Christ. You know, just looking at a brother in the audience who just started coming a few months ago, and thought, "Wow, he's really caught fire." You know, it's exciting to see what the Lord's doing. You know, and I'm telling you right now. If your walk is getting kind of like, ah, oh, you know, it's getting, you know, kind of spiritually lethargic, man, get the salt out of the shaker. We're the salt of the world, amen? Don't hide your light under a bushel. Let the Lord use you for the purposes he made you and created you, amen? And then you begin to share in the joy of the Lord as you begin to serve the Lord. So I love what Paul does here. He reminds them of their service to the Lord Jesus Christ with him. And I think what he's doing there, he's trying to get them to realize the bigger picture and get back to the main focus, and that is serving the Lord. And now it's interesting, number seven, he reminds him of something else in verse, seven, in verse three. He says, fellow workers at the end of verse three, whose names are where? In the book of life, amen? He reminds them that they are citizens of heaven. In fact, in chapter, in chapter four, I skipped verse one, but if you look at the context, if you look at verse 1, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, I'm sorry, yeah, who I long to see, look what he says here, my joy and crown. And then he says, stand from the Lord, my beloved. So it's interesting, listen to what he says here. Back up now to chapter 3, just two verses before it, verse 20 and 21. Look at chapter 3, verse... Now, keep in mind, there were no chapter breaks in this letter. There were no chapters and verses. Those were put in by men, amen? So he would have just said this, verse 20, for our citizenship is where? In heaven. 
from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into uh, conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He reminds them that they are citizens of the kingdom of God, citizens of heaven. And then in verse, th verse 3 and 4, that they are, verse 3, that their names are where? In the book of life, amen? We have something far bigger going on than little squabbles, amen? We have something far bigger than going on than little quarrels that could distract us from remembering who we are in Christ and reaching people for Jesus. Oh, we have to deal with issues. We have to deal with them biblically. And if there's not a biblical verse that deals specifically with a specific, specific issue, that's where we need to have grace upon each other when we have different opinions, amen? When something's not contrary to the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, it's interesting. Number eight, he says this. He says, look at verse two. I say this for toward the end. I urge, I urge. See that word urge? I urge you, Odia, and I what? Urge, there it is again. And I urge Syntyche, right? To live in harmony in the Lord. Notice Paul emphasizes that he's urging them. We need to urge each other more to walk with Jesus. We need to encourage e each other more. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some, amen? Remember, we talked about that. If we're told that as Christians we can never get together again, you know, I mean, we try to obey the laws, right? Social distancing, you know, wearing our mask when we're inside, you know, uh, even outside trying to give each other respect and distance and do all that. But if we're told that as Christians we can't get together anymore and uh, it's, it's against the law to encourage one another in Christ and so forth, we know that we have to still encourage each other in the Lord. We have to find legal ways to do it. If we can't find legal ways to do it, we still need to do it because God's law is above man's law. As it says in Acts chapter 5, better obey God than men. But as Christians, we should be the most, uh, the best citizens we could possibly be in any nation because we're ambassadors for Christ, amen? As Paul says, we're citizens of heaven. We've talked about that. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ on this planet and we shine his light. So we seek to obey the laws unless they tell us to disobey the laws of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because that's the one we're going to stand before in Judgment Day, amen? He's the one that created us. He's the one that gave his life for us. But notice Paul says, I urge you, I urge you, I urge you. And you know how many scriptures encourage us to, over and over again, to be in fellowship with one another, to encourage one another? I have all kinds of scriptures I'm not even going to quote. I'm not even seeing the clock up here. Okay, now I see it. Okay. Uh, now I can see it. Got to kind of shine that light off my hands into the little tiny clock there. But let me just give you a couple examples. Anybody know the name of Barnabas, what it means? Barnabas' names means son of what? And remember? Son of encouragement, amen? He's the brother in Acts chapter 9 that helped the Apostle Paul before his Paul. Well, he became the Apostle Paul, but he was known as Saul. And he was Saul the terrorist, right? He's going around having Christians killed. Remember that? And then also he's converted and the disciples, they had a hard time believing it. They thought he came out to spy their liberty or that because he was having Christians dragged off as a member of the Sanhedrin. And before, you know, the authorities, and he stood there while Stephen was stoned to death. So they were kind of freaked out about this guy, Saul, who wrote, end up writing half the New Testament, amen? But that just didn't happen. He didn't just say, oh, great, Saul's converted. Now he's a Christian. He's going to write half the New Testament letters. No. They were skeptical of him at first. And Barnabas, and we don't know exactly what happened between Paul and Barnabas, but Barnabas lived up to his, up to his name, son of encouragement. And it says that Barnabas took Saul and presented him to the disciples. He told them Saul's story. And Saul became, of course, the Apostle Paul. And they accepted Paul. And this is a brother that was, guess what? He was a peacemaker, amen? He was seeking to bring peace among the brothers and sisters and encourage them to Christ. Let's make sure that we're like a Barnabas, amen? Let's make sure we're like an Epaphroditus who gives our lives to be a blessing to others. We're, we're, each and every one of us say, should say, Lord, help me be more like Barnabas. Help me be a son of encouragement. Help me to urge other people to be in fellowship. Because the scriptures say, and I quote, let us hold fast, I'm sorry, fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another and love to love and good works, 
okay? Not neglecting our meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day of Christ drawing near. So as the coming of the Lord gets closer and closer, we ought to what? We ought to be encouraging one another. You guys know why geese honk? Why do you think they honk? Do you think it's because the one in front of them, they're like New Yorkers, they're in their way and they're just upset? No, it's not because they're New Yorkers, right? It's because they're encouraging each other. Scientists have found a couple reasons, and it's speculation. Science is a word that just means knowledge, and uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge isn't always perfect, and we come into more and more of an assertion of what is true and isn't. Even in the physical sciences, there's a lot still being learned. But they believe one reason is because they're encouraging each other just to go forward, amen? Urging each other not to quit the fight, to go forward. And a second reason, a second reason which I think is interesting, and this is according to, I was looking up an online, the uh, uh, Ontological Science Journal, Volume 13, Supplement, uh, in 2014, states this, Flight calls are species signals, and although their specific functions have yet to be identified, communication among individuals, particularly in situations where birds may experience confusion, seems to be of primary importance. The idea there is that so they can locate one another, so they can stay in formation, understand we, where each other are at. And I thought that's pretty cool because I've been using geese as an example for us, amen? Not only the V formation, working together, amen? Not only falling out and helping each other when someone's hurting, but also encouraging each other, honking for Jesus, amen? Honking for the Lord, encourage each other, don't give up. Be an encouraging Barnabas, amen? And also helping people stay the path so we can go in the right direction. And what's the right direction? Jesus said, the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Amen? The Bible says in Acts 4, 12, there, there's salvation only in one name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door, John chapter 10, verse 1. John 10, 9, if someone comes another way, he's a robber and a thief. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, amen? He is the way, the truth, and life, amen? And I encourage you to stay the path and encourage you to encourage other people on the right path to stay in the Lord, amen? And when you see a Syntyche and a Yodia pop up, pray for them, love them, encourage them in Jesus. Encourage them to agree one another, with one another in the Lord, amen? Praise God. Let's bow our hearts. Can we all please stand and bow our hearts before the Lord? If there's anybody here, perhaps you're visiting or perhaps you're watching by live stream, uh, I was told right after service last Sunday that we had about 2,400 people listening to live stream at that moment or during that time. And of course, we have many that pick it up later. And I, we have a pretty sizable live stream audience on, on uh, our midweek study too. We want to encourage you, if you're listening by live stream, that we want to encourage you to be heaven bound. We want to encourage you to make sure you're saved before you leave this planet. And the reason Jesus can say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me, is because he's the only one. He's the only one that paid for our sins on the cross, amen? He's the only one that's life was of value where he could give it because he is God. He became flesh, lived a perfect life. And we all, the Bible says, the wages of our sin is what? Death, amen? And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of God's glory. But the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord, amen? God gave himself on the cross as the God-man to pay the crimes that we're guilty of, to pay for them and suffer the punishment that we deserve because God is love and because God wanted us to be reconciled with himself, amen? So he's not only just, but he's also the justifier, it says, of the wicked. And he paid for the crimes of all humanity. And if any of us, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you haven't called upon the name of the Lord yet, the Bible says, if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's as simple as just turning to Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And putting your trust in him as you turn from a life of rebellion against him, and you turn to him for eternal salvation. He'll save you. Amen. Praise the Lord, you guys. It's a great, great, uh, great time this evening. Glad we could open up the yard and get together. There's a lot of waters back there. There's a bunch of bags of chips. You're not grabbing everybody's chips. You can grab a bag of chips or two. Uh, but love you guys very much. And let's all press on in Christ together. Amen. And be unified and encourage one another. Be unified in Christ. Amen.
Turn to somebody and give them a COVID air hug. <laughs> Love you guys. God bless you, man.